Now I'd like to introduce our speakers who will amaze us as they discuss the understanding computer. Fernando Pereira is a VP and engineering fellow at Google where he leads research and development uh, in natural language understanding and machine learning. Prior to joining Google in 2008, he was chair of the Department of Computer and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He has several patents and over 120 research publications on a range of subjects, including speech recognition, computational linguistics, and logic programming. But before they come up, to get a little insight into the kind of work that's been going on at Google under Fernando, watch this video. Okay, Google. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Okay, Google. Hey, Google. Play some dance music. Sure. This is fresh air. My guest will be Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix. OK, Google, count to 100. Sure. One, two, three. Play vacuum harmonica on my TV. 71, 72, yeah. 73. Play the Wonder Woman trailer. Hey, Google, talk to Dominus. Talk to Lonely Planet. Talk to Cora. Show me my photos from last weekend. Ah! Your car is parked at 22B. Today in the news. Turn the living room lights on. OK, turning on the lights. I'm back, baby. Hey, Google, drop a beat. Flip a coin. Call Jill. Set a timer. Talk to Headspace. And then just for a moment, I'd like you to let go of any focus at all. Just let your mind do whatever it wants to do. Done. Hey, Google. Good night. Turning off all the things. See you tomorrow. The revolution is happening fast. Our moderator tonight is John Markoff. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author. He joined the Computer History Museum as our historian in January of 2017. Prior to joining the museum, you probably recognize him as the business and technology reporter of the New York Times for nearly 30 years. Please join me in welcoming Fernando and John. Howdy. Uh, in 1982, when I was a much younger reporter, um, I, I went over to SRI, and there was a researcher there whose name was Gary Hendricks, who was just leaving, as it turns out, but I was given a demo, and Gary at that point had some Office of Naval Research money, and um, he had kind of a, a fancy captain station, and basically the idea was that you could control a ship by speaking to the, the bridge. It was an admiral advisor, I think it was what it was called. And you could basically say left, right, stop, and forward. And that's what I remember from the demo, was about four, four words. And the funny thing is, I just, when I was, uh, when I was looking at Fernando's uh, Vita, Fernando was just leaving as, no, you were just arriving as yeah. Gary, Gary yeah. was just leaving. Gary went off to do a, an interesting early um, unstructured database called Q&A, which was way ahead of its time. But, you know, since then we've had four decades almost, and um, now we have uh, probably more than a billion people who listen to and speak to machines. And this is really both the stuff of our dreams and our nightmares. On one side you have HAL and Space Odyssey, and on the other side you have Samantha and the movie Her, and the possibility of intimate relationships with computers. Last night I saw Blade Runner 2049, which actually has a very interesting and spooky scene about language being used to basically determine to what degree an android is human, um, which in that context is a bad thing. Um, but I, I want to stipulate at the outset that um, unlike some people in Silicon Valley, I, I believe that pronouncements about technology sort of more than three years in the future are probably science fiction for our purposes here. But it, it, but it is fun to speculate, and it's also important because these technologies, of course, are reshaping the world. And uh, the degree to which machines both understand and interact with us uh, will have a lot to do with things like equality, equality in our society and perhaps even the future of our democracy. Uh, so with that, I, I want to begin by asking how you got here. And oh. so you started in Portugal. 
Yes. So let's go all the way back. Yeah, and so, so how did you get into this yeah, field? So um, I actually started getting interested in language, in, language, uh, it, in, uh, in college, beginning of college. Some friends of mine were, had gotten interested in AI back then, and many, you know, uh, Shall I say the, the date? Yeah, you should. Because should. I give us 1970. Okay. Then, and um, actually, the first, one of the first books I saw um, uh, in AI, AI books that they had was this uh, uh, collection that Ed Feigenbaum edited, Computers and Thought. Yeah. And I read these papers, and, and there was some about language understanding, in fact. One, I think there was a John McCarthy paper there. And, these things just completely, the, the advice, there was this advice to take a paper. I can't remember all the papers and all the authors, but this thing completely convinced me this is what I wanted to do. You were a math student at the time. Yeah, math student. Start, well, actually, as an electrical engineering student, and then I switched into math. But, okay. uh, but basically, uh, the, the idea that you could m somehow get a sort of a mathematical take on how language conveys meaning is something that completely took hold of me and that has never left. That's, it's, so, but also, I mean, just to jump back for a second, Fernando was telling me a story before we started about basically scrounging for Fairchild transistors in high school. Is yeah, that, that, that was just like building little amplifiers and But that was like that. kind of a Steve Jobs thing, you, but you did manage to get the transistors. Yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> but it was just for fun, you know, it's not, 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 nothing of substance. But I, I started getting interested in, in language, you know, so I also, at the time, uh, started reading a little bit about linguistics, but also, you know, a lot of work in logic and uh, through my, you know, math uh, background and, so on, and, and computer science, starting automata theory and things of that kind. And, and so all of these things have been always in a, in a place together in my, in my way of thinking. And then, of course, m later ideas for probability and, and uh, information theory and so on. But, uh, so it's never been to me a discontinuity, even though there's such, people see great discontinuities in AI between say the, tr the sort of symbolic AI of the, of the six, to, well, 50s into the, in, into the 80s and now the neural network uh, views that are very com seem completely different to, to me actually they are all part of a, of a whole in, and the reason why we're still so struggling with making these things work, like what you saw in that video, is that uh, we actually don't know how they all fit together. We don't know how inf reasoning and inference fit together with you know, reactive uh, uh, responses that you can easily learn to supervise learning. So that, that dis those disconnects are things that are still, we're still working on today. Uh, and I think they were underlying a lot of the debates in the 50s uh, about the nature of intelligence and the relationship between logic and uh, sort of the sort of the, the, the beginnings of, of computational neuroscience. When, as a historian, one day you should write a book about the, his, the 50s, because the 50s are the seed of all of this, you know. You know, when people, you know, like when Ro McCarthy and, 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 was, was yeah, the, and, and the old McCulloch and Pitts and the, the work on, the, on sort of the sort of very early artificial neural network ideas, uh, people like uh, Ross Ashby was a cyberneticist in, the, in England uh, who uh, influenced me a lot early on when I, I was, you know, starting this area. But was it, I mean, in reading Feigenbaum and being influenced, influenced by Ashby, were you at all intrigued by the idea of building a thinking machine? Or was it more cogn, I mean? No, it's what? language from, as was from the beginning, the question, the sort of the question of how do we have this very flexible communication system that yet allows us to do also things like reason logically, and, uh, but also communicate things which are very informal, very vague, and very uncertain. Um, so this sort of spectrum of capability in, in uh, communication and reasoning, something that still in, puzzles us today, and it was puzzling me back then, it was not as much about, you know, I've never really got super excited about theory improving or, or any kind of the more uh, purely um, in, inward looking parts of AI, which had to do with sort of kind of a mach machines that could think very hard, right? It, rather, the simple things of communication seem so simple to us. You know, we all, you know, have an, a, a first language we learned when we, we were, you know, one, two, three, 
and yet that debt facility is still el eludes our machines yeah. today. So when you went to study, did you go to Edinburgh? Did you yeah, so I, I why went. Did you go, why, did you <laughs> why? So uh, it's through some, again, so the, the fr my friends in, in Portugal, one of them had been a postdoc in Edinburgh, and through that I, I saw that they were a sort of, I was also interested in uh, the use of logic to describe this kind of uh, um, computational processes for language processing, and they this, this, this uh, and um, through that I, you know, I actually didn't know quite where to go, but, uh, but Edinburgh is where someone I knew uh, had been, and the, the people working in computational logic then, uh, people like Robert Kowalski and had been to, to Edinburgh and others, and, and um, uh, Boyan Moore of the f famous theorem prover, and all, there was a kind of a culture there of logic as applied to uh, problem solving and to, but also to a little bit I kind of intuited that we could also apply this to language, and at the same time, there was this work going on in um, in France uh, of using logical representations of grammatical rules that Alain Colmaroa, who was at Marseille then, had started, and all of this kind of blended together. And I was in between college and and when I to, to grad school, I spent a couple of years dabbling with these things. And I had a day job as a develop you know, doing various kinds of programming for civil engineers and, per, and uh, architects, but uh, I also was exploring a little bit ideas in AI. I, I was curious about setting this up because I was wondering if you were aware of this uh, event in, in England called the, 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 the Light Hill debate. Oh, yes. Did yes. that influence? So no, I, I mean, I, I, I learned about it later, right? I, okay. I, yeah, so the... This yeah. is a debate on, on, on just the question of AI that happened very early. McCarthy yeah. came over and participated. Yeah, Le so the Light Hill Report, in a, uh, I don't remember the full name of the gentleman, but he was, a, I think, yeah. was a fluid, me fluid mechanics person, if it I remember. He was brought in by the government to, the, the, the to look at, I mean, it's not, n not so different from the ALPAC report in the, in the 60s in the United States that the, destroyed all the work in machine translation and other the computers in the, natural language processing for similar reasons is say, this is a very hard science, why are these people dabbling with computers here? Clearly you need to do fundamental advances and, let, and not fund this more applied work because it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that really set back a lot of the, the work in AI in the UK and also the, the equivalent, the Alpac report in the United States set back work on, uh, on you know, the, what led later to um, yeah. machine translation. And, and I, I asked because, uh, did it affect your career? Because, you know, Jeff Hinton, uh, who was later very influential in the field, largely came to America because the funding was canceled. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I, I came to the United States for a similar reason. I mean, there was, uh. Uh, well, they, I mean, they, I, I couldn't go to Portugal back then, or at least there was nothing that I could go to directly because of the economy was struggling after the revolution. In, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity in terms of academic positions. And uh, in the UK, the same situation, the situation from result of various uh, funding cuts and so on, there wasn't really uh, much opportunity. Uh, and I had interacted with some people from SRI at the time, and, uh, and uh, particularly um, Bob Moore and Stan Rosenshine, and uh, where I get, had given the talk in some uh, workshop, and they liked what I saw, and they, Say, why don't we apply for a job here? And say, why not? You know, <laughs> California, the weather is a little bit closer to Lisbon than uh, than Edinburgh is, so why not? And, and so at at that point, basic neural net technology had been around for a while. Was it on your radar at all? You were logic. Not okay. not really. No, I so uh, I kept paying attention to it a little bit, but uh, I just don't have any sense that it could do anything in practice. In particular, it's still the case today that oh, the, the kinds of things I was interested in then and still now that have to do with uh, kind of more complex representations of the meaning of language are not easy to do even with neural networks of today. You have to struggle to get some of those things to sort of work. And, uh, and back then, there was no connection between the two things. So I, I just couldn't put the two together, even though the math of neural networks was so cool. You know, it's just like, it was frustrating, because it's like, and uh, clearly brains, whatever they do, they don't, they don't do symbolic logic. But on the other hand, 
uh, I just have no idea how I can make these other things do that kind of thing, or even the, the simple grammatical uh, manipulations that, that you know, a four-year-old can do. Yeah. So from uh, you know, the fact that both Hinton and yourself ar arrived in America in part because of funding decisions made at a governmental level, is that a cautionary tale? I, mean <laughs> I don't know. I, but uh, certainly uh, when you are in that state, stage of your career, uh, you know, you're just not thinking systematically about you know, what things could be 20 years or 40 years later. It's more like, where can I go where I can have, do the kinds of things I want to do? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's so I gave me this opportunity, and um, you know, I showed up in uh, in Menlo Park in uh, uh, September 11th, 1982, and it was pouring, which was like, <laughs> hey, I came to California, what's this? And then it proceeded to be one of the wettest winters in on record. Uh, you know, the 82, 83 winter is infamous. Did you get to ski at all? Oh, no, I couldn't <laughs> ski then. I know, you know I, I was like, you know, you know, uh, so it's, it was not a... I mean, uh, you're unusual in one sense, is you've had a, a, a real broad range of working in different scientific engineering and, and corporate laboratory yeah. settings. And I, I just, so you've, you, you, you ran an academic department, you ran a department lab at Bell Labs, you've mm -hmm. worked as an engineer in a corporate research setting, now you run, uh, is there any, I mean, what can you take away about these different, um, uh, these different settings? I'm, I'm thinking about the question of innovation and where more and less innovative places to be. Um, they can, look, I, I think they can all be innovative in their own ways at the right time. Uh, I, mean, the, I mean, just the lesson I take, for instance, I, I'll, take, I'll give you two lessons. One is uh, that uh, AT&T really uh, made some very bad decisions um, in the in the the seventies and eighties and into the nineties, uh, both business decisions and decisions of what kind of technology to invest in. And uh, I, I'll just give a story. And of course, we are here among friends, so I'm going to say kind of a like just someone just <laughs> fairly senior at uh, AT and T told me um, in. Uh, 2000, that no one would ever make any money from a search engine. <laughs> 2000? Yes. Uh, because some, some of us had some ideas for a search that were actually well ahead of our, its, their time. One of those people came to Google earlier than the others <laughs> and uh, had a very influential career in the company. Uh, from, uh, That's very funny. Well, I have a, a confession to make. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard yeah. to see what's right. Oh, I, I, I have to have my response to that comment. I said, nobody is going to make any money from DNS either, but if it, if it disappeared tomorrow, someone would find a way to pay for it. <laughs> right. I, I was uh, inside the garage, the Google garage on Willow Road, and there were so many search engines at that time that I didn't yeah. even write about it, yeah. which I regret to this day. So yeah. sometimes it's hard to, to see even a little way down the road. So the second comment is about academia. Um, so uh, I, I, I did funded research at SRI, and I left when, uh, at the time, part of the reason I left is that uh, funding became too short term. Uh, as DARPA transformed as a result of legislation and various other factors at the end of the, uh, of the 80s, and it just stopped being fun. Uh, it was a bit like, uh, I, mean, the, the, I don't know, there's this joke that we say about the, the former Soviet Union that uh, uh, you pretend to work and they pretend to pay you, and the joke, <laughs> the parallel joke I said is that you pretend you're going to do what they want, and they pretend to believe you. Uh, and, um, and so it, it was not a very um, you know, attractive uh, environment to do interesting, creative things. Um, and so, I went to Bell Labs then, where there was really some interesting opportunities. I, I had gotten very interested in speech, um, speech recognition. Um, there was some very nice speech work going at SRI at the, at the time that led then to the fu uh, founding of Nuance at, later on after, you know, this is a couple, couple of years after I left. Uh, I think I, the timing is not quite right in my memory maybe, but, um, and uh, so I, I did a, quite a bit of work on speech uh, um, 
at, uh, at Bell Labs and uh, mostly on, on modeling the language part of speech and coming up with the algorithms and data structures to do fast, uh, you know, uh, essentially uh, search over a set of possibilities, uh, um, which was very necessary back then because the statistical models we're using were so weak that you couldn't disambiguate anything if you didn't search over a very large number of, uh, of choices. That's quite different today with the much richer neural network models used today in speech recognition. You can, uh, you don't need to search nearly as much. And that's why you can have such good real-time speech recognition. Okay. Uh, but um, so during, when I came, uh, so again, Bell Labs was a, a very good environment. And then when the, the, there was a split between uh, Lucent and at and continued on the at t side, still doing speech, but also a lot more and more machine learning. Very good environment till essentially when I left, which is a time when uh, at t decided that, you know, they didn't know what to do with all this stuff that they were doing on the research side. And the, the, in the, a very good period of research at the uh, at t labs, you know, starting coming to an end. And uh, a lot of those people dispersed to other two industry, to academia. Yeah. Um, when I, um, then I, and that's when I went to, you know, with a little stop at the startup, long, long story I won't go into, um, but just kind of a fun place actually and did some uh, uh, interesting work that, uh, um, research work there as well. Um, I could, the, the thing which uh, is a problematic with academia, which again is, is that the funding climate strangely is short term. So uh, you got, would get into situations where you put together a research proposal, you got it funded, you work on it some and got some interesting results, but there was still a lot more to do. And then you sent, you try to put the follow-up proposal and you'd say, they would say, well, you've already done that. Why, why continue? You know, do, you know, propose something completely different. So basically I started realizing that if you want to do something big with, with really sustained impact, you, it was very difficult. You would have to, again, play games to try to pretend to do one thing and do another. To, so that they could have a long-term, a 10-year project. Uh, some of the most successful projects that I've done at Google, in fact, some of the technology that goes into that and a lot helps that thing happen. I mean, there's a lot of technology there that my team doesn't have anything to do with. It's a big, you know, thousands of people, you know, work, including all of search, to make something like that happen. But some of the core, some pieces of what happens there depends on technology that took us eight years to develop. Yeah. Um, and now, so it's funny because people think about the industry as being short term, but in fact, my experience, and of course I've been very lucky because Google has had been very successful as a company before, in, before I showed up, but that we could work for the long term and build technology. And even today I'm working on coming up with developing new programs and new research that I don't think is going to pay, pay off in another few years, you know, maybe even five years, uh, but which is necessary because problems like language understanding are so hard. They require so much experimentation, so, met, so much failure that just thinking that you have a three-year NSF proposal grant to, and th at the end of it, you're done, it's, it's absurd. Not long enough. Did, did you, at AT&T, did you cross paths with Jan LeCun, who's now director of oh, AI yeah. research? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, Jan, Jan is a good friend. I learned a lot from him. Uh, you know, he's one of the pioneers of uh, applying neural networks to certain language tasks, in fact. The work that they did on uh, check reading uh, at AT&T using these uh, cascades of neural networks, structured neural networks is still uh, one of the it's in one of the older pieces of work that him and uh, Joshua Benju and others did, but it's still, to me, one of the big uh, lights in the field. And um, yeah, so I, I follow him a lot and so talk to him a lot. He was here on a panel that I moderated last yeah. week on uh, AI and social good, and I was actually kind of surprised because I'm making a transition here to talking about the rate of progress and how yeah. quickly the field yeah. is going. And I was wondering, so Jan was, well, I want to play a video of what okay. he said. And let's, let's sort of see, I want to get your reaction. Sure. To, can we play the Jan LeCun video from last week? It's currently very frustrating to talk to a chatbot because there, the depth of, the, of their knowledge is extremely limited, narrow. Most existing deployed chatbots are actually entirely scripted by people. Uh, there's very little machine learning uh, going on there at the moment. 
all of us are furiously working to fix this, but we don't really have a solution. We have things that might help us build chatbots that are kind of somewhat specialized in areas like, you know, I don't know, movies or restaurants or sports or something like this. And, you know, before we have chatbots that can have general discussions uh, that, that are frustrating, can answer any question whose answer is somewhere uh, available, this is going to take quite a while. So what's your sense? Is that, are, are you of the same? Uh, so uh, partly yes, partly no. So yes, it's going to take quite a while. But I think that uh, one of the, I think Jan is making a, a mistake there that is common among people who are core machine learning people, that, which is assuming to some extent that everything that, you go, that this chatbot is going to know and be able to do it has to be learned from a particular situation and interaction with a trainer of some kind. But of course, that's not how we, we learn, right? We learn from interaction, of course, but we also, as we become a little bit more skilled at language, we learn, for instance, from reading. Uh, and uh, reading is a much less directly interactive, it's cognitively interactive, but it's not something that uh, is, is, a kind, is a kind of learning where you essentially, a lot of the knowledge that you need to acquire is has been pre-digested for you by a writer or by a teacher in general. And, and I think there is a lot more that you can do. In fact, that's what the search engine does, right? Is to try to read the documents poorly, but still, uh, to allow you to answer the questions you ask. So uh, it's not in that video, but one of the areas that I think has been most exciting to work that we've done at Google the last 10 years is, is a project that is a large project, but uh, a part of it started in my, in my group, uh, where you started answering questions like, you know, when was the 14th Amendment ratified with a specific date? How do you do that, right? You have to actually read the document that is potentially a result and find an actual date. Um, and you can make mistakes in doing that. The reading mach machinery that we use today, even today, is relative, you know, it's very limited. But the fact is, this chatbot should not be taught just by interact, you know, being trained in sort of a traditional machine learning perspective, but should also be able to access all this knowledge out there and integrate in various ways. So those are things that I think are much more promising than just saying, these chatbots are scripted. Well, they are scripted because they don't know anything. And since they don't, and they can, not just they don't, they cannot know anything because they cannot go out there and read. And yet someone, those of us who work with, closely with search, uh, you know, people and worked on real, in things related to search, know that there's been a steady progress in our ability to understand more and more the content of, of the web and, con and content, you know, text in general even though we are very, very far from achieving human performance, but we can, we're making progress and that progress is visible. And uh, if, the, if the chatbot is to answer questions, there, I could tell you, and there's a pretty good one, it's called Google. Why don't you try it? <laughs> we'll see what he says. So recently in an interview, you talked about approaching a tipping point. You, you referred to it as a transition. Yeah. Can you talk about what the transition might be? How would you describe it? it how imminent is it? I mean, well, so, how so approach. What is approach? So, so let me uh, start by saying something about uh, about all. You know, again, that video was very good because it helps me point to you what what is hard there. When I, when you say uh, you know uh, play the latest Dave Holland album, you know something has in in the in fact you know, your music system goes and finds this thing and finds the dates and decides this is the latest, the most recent one and, and actually plays it. There's a binding between your words and things outside your words. Like there is someone named Dave Holland who's a musical artist and he has an album and they, they maybe has several of them and one is most recent. All of those pieces of interpretation connect to all sorts of information about music and people and so on. That connection is really hard to bootstrap by, uh, because if, you, if your system doesn't know anything, how are you going to train it to know something? You have to start somewhere. So typically what we do is we start with some 
handwritten heuristics, rules uh, that sketch out a very, very simplistic or limited kind of dialogue. And maybe there's, those heuristics are also related, uh, tied to search ranking and, and which also uses machine learning, but it's also many other things. So we start to in this space where um, we have a relatively limited ab ability to communicate with the system. And then once you feel that, people start using it. And as they're starting using it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And uh, if we look at the situations in which it doesn't work, we can use that to drive machine learning to make it better. Um, and, that's and that's where the tipping point is. When you start getting evidence that, oh, this, these are other examples of someone trying to do that same thing that failed, I can use that as specific training data and say, oh, these ones mean the same as that one. Once I can say that two things sort of mean the same, I, can have, I have examples of meaning the same. And I, if I can continue this process iteratively over a, a period of time with many, many users, I can in, grow the realm of understanding for the system uh, because they now say more things mean the same. So you've been doing this, though, for what, a half a decade, a decade? Well, so uh, for the kind of thing you saw there for much less than that. Okay. Uh, you know, the, like the playing the music or whatever. So you know, you're the still actions. getting increasing returns. Oh, yeah. We, we're getting very increasing returns. You know, I, I mean, every few months there's a new project that, uh, you know, I hear about they say, oh, they are using this thing we did that, you know, is now getting, you know, increasing the coverage. Increase, I mean, a lot of what's happened now for question answering, simple question answering, which predates the, the Google Assistant that's shown there, uh, we've been doing that for longer, and there again, there's been a growth in understanding coming out of the fact that we can cover more and more of language by realizing that this particular um, phrase or sentence is related to, in meaning, to this other one, yeah. and exploiting that to build systems that can understand a wider variety of forms of expression. So let's put a stake in the ground. I, I installed um, Google Assistant today to just try it out. And of course, the first thing I asked it was, um, because one of the neatest features in Google Maps is it tells you how long to bike someplace. I said, um, how long will it take me to bike um, to the left bank in Menlo Park? And it failed. So why did it fail? I have no idea. You would have to. <laughs> Could be many things. OK. Yeah, You're yeah. working so, much below that. No, no, no. It's the reason is that I, the, the various forms are, are fit. But I, I'll give you a better, a, an example that, this people, that everybody will enjoy. Uh, uh, this is now fixed, Sandra. But a few, month, a few months ago, there was this following query that someone uh, asked, uh, I, you know, through the same means, either with, by voice or by text. How long has Theresa May been PM? Okay. And the answer was uh, 1.72 uh, billion picometers or something like that. <laughs> I don't billion. And you know, people just like laughed like you and say, well, how could that happen? <laughs> well, here's, uh, so, now, let me give another example, because this requires a little bit of explanation. If I say, who won the 19, uh, uh, 2017 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics? You know, I get some results from Google. Uh, if I s ask the question, uh, 2017 uh, Physics Nobel, I also get some results. Actually, <laughs> as it turns out, by two different paths, which is kind of a uh, something which is a little bit weird, but uh, bear with me. Now, notice the first one was a well-formed, full English sentence. The second one is just a bunch of keywords. Now, because so many people use a bunch of keywords to go, we have to be able to pre deal with that. So if I, and, but to do that, often we have to ignore the grammatical details to be more robust of variation when people leave out the how long or uh, being and so on. Uh, so we just pick the, key, the, the sort of the, the important content words. In the case of the Theresa May example are long, Theresa May, and PM. Now we have three things, long, PM, long, length, length, uh, what's 
PM, oh, that might be a good unit of measure, picometers. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so um, the, po the point I'm trying to make here is that there's this great tension between having systems that are robust to the, all the variety of ways that people speak, in particular if you speak to a machine, and the way in which we naturally use grammar to disambiguate language in ways that are not even clear to, to the speaker. This is totally intuitive. That's what know, knowing a language is, being able to deploy the expressive power of that language, including its syntax, to convey a particular meaning. Our algorithms, our machine learning models, can't quite do that right. They cannot combine both, both grammar being able to use the grammar when it's there and yet be able to back off to a sort of more semantic intuition where the grammar is not there. Being able to balance those things is still beyond that. Is another breakthrough needed or is it a simple matter of scaling? Uh, ask me in three years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so, think, I think actually breakthrough is needed because none of the machine learning techniques we have today are able to represent the structure that we believe exist in language understanding and in fact that a lot of psycholinguistics teaches us about in ways that are allow you to have this sort of trade-off between sort of what words evoke in your mind and this, this, the grammatical structure that puts some order and selection among the many things that, say if you hear PM, it could be prime minister, it could be picometer, it could be afternoon, you know, how do you know what it is? Well, it could be that if I say long and PM and say, oh, we're talking about, you know, length, but actually if you have put this, the, the, the other words around it, you say that how long, you're talking about the duration. Yeah. Being something, you're talking about the state. So you're asking very abstractly about the duration that some entity has been in a state. This is a level of uh, inference and reasoning that none of these machine learning systems today can do. So, so there's another, an, another level even that I, I'm wondering about. When Siri was first introduced, um, people were experimenting. They would say things like, Siri, I'm thinking of shooting myself. And Siri would helpfully respond, I know of two or three gun stores fairly close to you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, no. That, of yeah. course, has been fixed. Uh, and now it tells you, it sends you yeah. a suicide prevention hotline. Yeah. But it, what about that level of context? Is that another, is that s similar? Or? It, well, that, that's an even worse side of, I mean, that, that, you know, it's not so much about now grammar and, and the, the, in the, the meanings of individual words in context. It's really about intent and about, um, you know, if you say, I'm thinking of baking a cake, perfectly reasonable to send you to, the, uh, to a store where you can buy baking supplies, right? So what's the difference? Yeah. The difference has to do with human behavior and human society, and uh, those are much subtler. I mean, there's, uh, and much further out, I think, in terms of, you know, yeah what we can do that, hey, you know, someone thinking of doing something like that, that's a bad thing, that's something we should, I should try to help them not do. That requires an understanding of the sort of the social and moral universe that's well beyond, you know, it's certainly not in my working life, let alone maybe like, you know. Uh, so, uh, it's been a year since Microsoft made this announcement that their speech recognition, recognition system had achieved parity with human transcribers in, in, in terms of this thing called the switchboard corpus. Yes. And yet, you know, I'm a, I'm a working journalist, and, and there are now a series of services like Temi and Trent and Pop-Up Archive. I don't think Google has a service that offer machine transcription, not translation. And they're, they seem to me to be at about the 80 or 90 percent level, not at parity. Yeah. So what about getting to parity and how, uh, in real world kinds of? <laughs> well, so, so there, there's a, I, I, I don't know whether there are people in the trade here, but uh, a sort of a dark secret of a lot of these uh, one-upmanship in, uh, in press releases is that a lot of these benchmarks that they use for academic purposes of, uh, are very much past their sell-by date. 
right? <laughs> uh, they basically, uh, what happened is, once upon a time, DARPA, in this case, for, uh, funded the collection of this data in, in the, the manual transcription so that you can train and evaluate uh, speech recognition systems. Uh, a bunch of teams in the last however many years, I think maybe 20 years, I don't know how long Switchboard has been around, but maybe something like that, have been hill climbing on that task. Yeah. So anybody saying, oh, we do, we do as good as human transcribers in Switchboard means nothing. Uh, you know, as your practice is much more real, right? Yeah. And, you know, that kind of 90, 90 few, you know, 90 something percent is where we are in practice. That's where we are in, in our, uh, in the practice that you saw up there. Um, and, uh, and going beyond that requires a bunch of different things. Uh, first of all, our modeling of speech is still pretty mediocre with respect to, under to capturing the, the varieties of different speech styles and different accents, uh, male, female, child, of different, like pitch, variation, intonation. There are many things that these systems sort of do, but not do as well as a, a good human listener does. Um, the other thing is that they lack the kind of a detailed context about, I'll give, it, I'll give an uh, anecdote here. So I'm Portuguese and you might think, well, you can understand Brazilian Portuguese. Well, I can't, right? You know, I, or sometimes I can. But the interesting thing is it's a very different language, especially in phonetically different. Uh, but if I attend to it very carefully, I can understand it. It happens to me time, again, like today it happened. I was at, a, at one of the Google Cafe and there were some people talking next to me well, I, uh, and I was like, what are they saying? What language are they speaking? And then I start focusing on it, and I realize it's Brazilian Portuguese. And once I realize that, I start understanding what they're saying. And uh, now this kind of ability to tune your hearing to the speaker, and even to tune which language it is they think they are speaking, is something that is not at all in, in the, uh, the systems we have today cannot do. Uh, and in the context, you say, oh, this is a bunch of, these are a bunch of probably Google engineers from, from uh, the, the Belo Horizonte uh, 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 office, and they're visiting, and they're talking about some technical topic. And once you know that they're talking about some technical topic, you immediately understand what they, because they, of course, they are code, doing code switching between Portuguese and, and English, and that makes it even more complicated. I can do this, go to this process, with way far from doing that with our machines today. Okay. I, and just one more baseline, because this, this, this fascinates me, and it's an answer to this question of progress. A, a couple of years ago, I saw a copy of a, a, a letter, I, somebody from IARPA, the intelligence community's ARPA, sent to the academic community, mm -hmm. the natural language yeah. processing letter, and I just wanted to read a, a small yeah. s section from it. There is currently a failure in DITRA's Defense Threat Reduction Agency's ability to extract evidence of preparation of development of weapons of mass destruction and weapons of mass destruction attacks. 60% of sentence level events are missed or misclassified. However, post hack analysis indicates that evidence of weapons of mass destruction incidents was usually manifest in reports and other communications available at the time. So to me, that seemed, I mean, that's real world what the intelligence community was doing two years ago. Mm -hmm. Have we made any significant progress since then? I, I, I don't know whether they have made any progress, but <laughs> fair, I wouldn't fair. be surprised. I mean, so this doesn't surprise me at all because uh, the, all the techniques we have today for language understanding at the level uh, are very poor at creating a, a sort of a picture, a model of what it is that is being discussed in the text. Uh, so when you're listening to or reading something, you're constantly constructing a little mental model of you know who are the participants, what are they doing, what's their relationships, and so on. Uh, and do that in a robust way that takes into all sorts of context information and social information you have, all, all the background knowledge you have, experience you have, physic you know, experience of physical environment. Uh, you no, know, we were talking in the green room, we were talking about backcountry skiing. You know, I, we didn't need to explain to each other what that was, right? We talk about, you know, in the, in the, the describing our, our mishaps in backcountry skiing, we didn't explain why that happened. It was very easy to explain. Uh, 
there's a ton of context. Someone who doesn't know anything about that topic would find difficult to understand the, even what we are talking about. Uh, now, here's opening this machine trying to, you know, uh, read text which was probably written by an adversary who doesn't want to be found out. And they're trying to decode that text. Now, the kind of intelligence and experience and knowledge that the you know, an intelligence analyst brings to a task like that is completely different from the kind of very naive understanding of events and participants and actions that even our best language understanding systems have today. Yeah. So I really want to sort of get you to put on a sociologist hat for oh, a little gosh. while. We're getting close. I know that's unfair, but I, I want, yeah. I'm trying to understand where this is going. And I, I want to ask you about this experiment that Microsoft conducted in China um, with a, a conversational agent. They did something in America. It didn't work out so well. It was called Tay. It turned misogynistic. No let's, comment. Let's, let's set that aside. But, but Zhao Aisen, uh, which was the conversational agent in China, was actually much more interesting because it it basically got a rapt audience of largely young Chinese, millions of people who would have as many as 60 on average interactions with this system a day. It was not intended to be a productivity tool the way Siri and Google now are. Um, you know, f phenomenal numbers, 25% of, the, of the, these young Chinese uh, texting I love you to it. So, uh, so this is looking at it from the other side. This was, you know, all they did was they, they basically trolled the Chinese social media web for QA pairs, and they created a kind of system that would give you a plausible answer to virtually anything you typed. Mm -hmm. And they got some kind of you know, engagement. So, I, I mean, do you think about that, looking at it from the human side as opposed to the machine side? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 in, in the, I th what, what do I think? I, mean, I, th I think there are lots of lonely people in the world, uh, <laughs> and uh, especially in a society that has a, a male-female imbalance like China does, yeah. it's probably not helpful. Um, and also, uh, people, lots of people have very boring jobs, and you know, just having a little conversation machine might be fun, as a, even though they are not deluded what they're doing. It's kind of a, it's part, basically, I mean, think about uh, doing uh, playing all sorts of video games, right? You know, in a sense, playing with something like this, is, you can think as a game, figure out how far can this thing go? What can I get it to yeah. m make it do? I mean, it's actually kind of an interesting puzzle if you think about it. So there could be all sorts of motivations, some sadder, some more fun, that uh, are behind the sort of popularity of the, such a system. Um, it's an experiment, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't draw much of a moral from it, except that we have to be aware of, you know, we have to understand how these systems we built are used and try to understand it better and try to uh, change their behavior and their how, uh, and the expectations around them if we feel that they are being used in a way that is detrimental for the, to their users, uh, it's sort of something we have to do with any technology we build, right? We we want it to be safe and to be helpful and to be uh, fun and uh, and not not addictive. Yeah. So I, I've 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 looked at this competition that is going on between the, the large technology companies in and out of Silicon Valley over over speech and conversation now, and one of the things that appears to set Google apart is you seem to have consciously decided not to anthropomorphize your assistant. Yes. And could you tell us, is there a Well, so I, I wasn't uh, a big player in those discussions. Uh, the, what has been done is something that I agree, totally agree with. Uh, I, I, I find that uh, our, I mean, partly because I've been working this technology for so long and some people, some of my colleagues think I'm a, I tend to be a little bit of a, a curmudgeon or sort of like conservative in some of these things and uh, too pessimistic. Um, the, as I, I don't like create illusions that are going to be shattered easily, right? This is some, these systems are so, I mean, they are useful, they are fun, uh, we're making steady progress, but they're still so far from the kind of, from really, really being, being able to talk with, have a, converse, a real conversation like the one we're having today. 
uh, that it's very, I think it's sort of a bit deceptive to try to pretend that you are something you're not. Yeah. Now, if you could do it with a twinkle in your eye, you know, maybe, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's very, humor doesn't come across very well in digital form. Yeah. So uh, I, I just don't, I feel more comfortable with the decisions we made here. You've raised something, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with who has said this recently, but in this debate over ethical machine behavior, um, someone has recently suggested perhaps a fourth law of robotics, and that is that machines must disclose that they are machines and not human. Yeah. And I, does that seem like a... I, I, I mean, to me, uh, deception is something I, I don't like to cooperate in. I think it's a, uh, it hurt, you know, it, it, it just is playing a game that uh, cannot end well because it's, people will be disappointed if they, and uh, I mean, you can suspend this belief for a little while, you know, after all, if you ever read a story to a child, you know, you know, if you, you know, you, you, you can, you need, you need to be able to write, read the Phantom Tollbooth to a kid and have them like be completely taken in. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, there's a moment where it ends and, or, or the chapter ends, you say, well, time to go to sleep now. And uh, that mom, you know, those moments need to be there. You know, it's good to have some fantasy or some, some pretend, but you have to be understand that it is pretend. Yeah. Um, um, so um, you know uh, that's that's you know my take on that. And, and yet we seem to be bumping up. Or maybe tell me how close we are. Um, Deep Mind technology, which I think is called WaveNet, was added to Pixel. Which yeah. Increasingly awesome. <laughs> awesome technology. It, 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 it makes it possible for these machines to sound more human-like. And I well, so so the the reason it's not just a question. Look, your understanding of speech, you know, a spoke, you know, a spoken message, both your understanding and your uh, it's not just a understanding. Feeling that it's kind of a good good experience depends on it being fluent speech. WaveNet is a revolutionary advance in producing fluent speech. Uh, it's not a question of faking it, being a human. It's rather a, que a question of making it good for, making it more uh, adjusted to how we perceive speech. So uh, there's all these sorts of studies about speech under understanding uh, synthetic speech that show that it's, al it's always been an, a, a very bad, in sort of trade-off between fluency, sounding good, and understandability. You know, when I was at Bell Labs, many of my closest colleagues worked in speech synthesis, and that was always the trade-off. You know, you can make it really understandable, but really grating, or you can make it really, uh, you know, smooth, but hard to understand. And then where does the technique called prosody, the, the ability you know, to- Yeah, prosody is absolutely critical for both fluency, for sound, for, because, a lot of what is important, when I say what's important in a, in a, a, a spoken message is emphasized through prosody. Uh, and this, so being able to put those markers, those accents, those speech accents in the synthetic speech that correspond to the intent of your message is really important. And, and so what a system like WaveNet enables you to do is to do that much more effectively. And we only started scratching the surface of what we can do with WaveNet. It's, it's, it's an amazing advance. Um, and, uh, and, but the purpose is not to fake humans. The pu purpose is to make it better for people to, li to make that communication more fluid, more effective, so that I understand what that, uh, you know, with the, with the Google Assistant is telling me so that I can respond or I can get, go on my way and do the, the thing I want to do. Um, right, and and that, that is part of why I still work in language understanding in it, is that in the end, this, I, I'm trying to get these machines to do my bidding and coding is a pretty poor way of getting there. It's a fun way for pe some people like me and I, I actually, I'm sometimes a little sad that I don't do as much programming these days as I used to, but 
uh, it's not really a, a scalable solution for the entire world. We want, you know, we want to get these machines to do, I mean, so here, here's my standard example. This is actually related to something we're working on. You know, you, you know you go on, on any kind of, uh, say, um, uh, music service or on Amazon and so on. You get all these recommendations or YouTube. You get a bunch of recommendations. Some are great, some are terrible. And, you know, if I start, uh, you know, um, one of the music uh, streaming services and say, oh, play me some jazz, sooner or later you have going to have Kenny G. And I cannot say, <laughs> never play any smooth jazz. Never, ever. Jazz goes to college. Yeah, and, and, and so, why not? Why can't I tell this thing what I mean and what I want? And that is why I work on, what, and we work on these projects, is that we would like the, the, the power and the flexibility of computation to be available to all people and to be able to instruct these machines to do your bidding in a more effective way. And that way, in the only way that can be, happen is if the means of communication between you and the machine are much more adapted to you, yeah. rather than being, uh, you know, coding. Even, you know, GUIs are very limited in many ways. Again, I cannot go and tell the GUI, no smooth jazz, right? <laughs> So I'm going to bring our audience in, but I want to ask you one last question. And this might be hard, but I want to ask you to take your Google hat off yeah. and keep your scientist hat on. Yep. Um, there's this, you know, Silicon Valley was very blessed in this country for a long time, and things seem to be resetting. Um, mm. There seems to be a growing debate. And there, there's, the debate is over the, the power of AI and the control of the technology by a small group of corporations. And have you, have you thought about the challenge that you know, this, if this is an effective and powerful technology, um, what responsibilities do you have as an individual scientist? So, first of all, uh, I have uh, a responsibility to try to teach uh, what the technology can do and not do. Uh, clearly, uh, honestly, uh, you know, and, uh, and make as much as possible public uh, as uh, we can without, you know, interfering with proprietary, you know, you know, legitimate commercial interests. Um, and for example, you know, we more and more open source our code. Uh, and in fact, we, I, my team has produced a lot of uh, training data for language processing systems that we've, pub, you know, cost substantial uh, amounts of money to Google to generate, but we put it pub out in, uh, you know, for the, the whole research community to have access to. I think the, bet, the most important thing is to make the technology open to more and more people across the world, uh, show what it can do and what and not do. Uh, you know, in the systems we build, we be very conscious that it can be abused and try to block the roads to abuse. I mean, one of the things, the systems are so, com you know, any, you know, complex system that is in a closed loop with society can be exploited. Very much like our bodies can be exploited by viruses. Uh, you know, any, you know, whether it be, you know, Google search or uh, Facebook uh, social networking, there's always uh, agencies out there who want to exploit this for their own ends. And this is very challenging because it's such as challenging almost as keeping you from getting a cold in the winter. Uh, and the same way as it's very frustrating that we can keep, keep getting colds, it's also very frustrating that there are these uh, other forces that are trying to exploit the system for their own purposes that, that may not be ethical. Uh, so that's one thing we have to be very aware of. But beyond that is to you know, educate to communicate, to make as much public and open source as possible so that others can build on it. On it. That you know, sm, you know, students all over the world can take our software and build on it. Like the, making you know, something like uh, TensorFlow uh, open source was deliberate move to make say, no, we want more people to be using this technology. And uh, my team has put to, uh, out a number of uh, natural language uh, analysis systems, again, in open source form. We are about to put another one out. Uh, and, uh, and the purpose there is to say, hey, this is not mysterious. This is algorithms, it's machine learning. 
you should learn how to use it. You should learn how it fails, and you should build on it. And so that's, that's I think, how, how I try to discharge my ethical obligations and, you know, but, you know, first do no, no harm and try to see how these systems could be abused and, and try to block those, those roads for, uh, you know, for abuse. There's some good questions here. Let's bring our audience in. Yeah. Um, would, what would you tell a 14-year-old girl to focus on in school to learn machine learning or natural language processing tasks and opportunities? 14. Oh, gosh, 14. 14. Where do you start at 14? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I love the question. Um, uh, so um, I think that she, she has to become fluent in some form of programming. It doesn't need to be, you know, uh, so that they can, you know, build. Do, so identify, find also things where you can do simple, small experiments. You know, there's a lot of very good materials out there with open source code and uh, lectures and, uh, and vi various videos and where you can actually play with things um, and build, you know, get code in a, in a, a, a Python notebook and in the modify and see what happens. Do a lot of experimentation with small things. So basically getting your hands in, in there, you just, Feeling that these things can be controlled, you can do an experiment and get the results you expect. Um, uh, it's more important that than formal education. The, much of what we do, this you know, in the success we have, is because we run experiments all the time. We run thousands and thousands of ex experiments. Most of them fail, but understanding what, how things work, and being able to adjust some parameter and see what happens. That's really that, that feeling that there's no failure, there's on, only learning, uh, it's pretty critical. Um, the other thing is grow a, th a thick skin. Uh, it's uh, very unfortunate that uh, a 14-year-old girl who has those interests is going to be held to a much higher standard and they treated in a much less friendly way than a 14-year-old boy. Uh, i sorry to say that's the case. I have a daughter. I know how that goes. And uh, I'm, uh, but, you know, you need your, you need to find good mentors, find someone to help you go through the, to those challenges and to keep you focused on learning your craft because it's, in much, it's not just science, it's also a craft and being, confident that you know how to control these systems and how to make them better and do it in small ways. Start in very small ways and let, you know, a lot, there's lots of playful things you can do in, with the, you know, games you can modify, with the little things you can make to learn how to follow a maze. There's, there's tons of, of that kind of material out there now and just try to control it. Try to understand how to manipulate yourself and to see that, you know, I know how this works. I will know what happens when they put this thing together. Uh, and that sense of confidence is what's going to help her a little bit to get overcome the doubts and the, and the negative messages from the society that surrounds her. Okay. Are you concerned with the security or, quote, hacking of natural language processing? Let me uh, propose a, a specific example. I wonder about the time that I will receive a phone call from my mother telling me that she's forgotten her bank account, but it won't actually be my mother. It will just sound like my mother. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I think it's going to take a while to get there, but uh, just in case, you know, I'm wrong, um, you uh, probably, there's a, that's just an, a change in degree from things already happen, right? Social, this kind of social engineering happens all the time. Uh, I just today got a call from uh, a bank and they say, oh, I uh, wanted to, uh, to talk to you because you came here to, the, to the, our, this branch a week ago. And I'm like, really? No, I didn't go to that branch at all. I have never been to that, to that bank in a, And then it says, oh, uh, maybe it was your wife. And I'm like, uh, I'm too busy. Uh, so, you know, it sounded like a, a, a 
legitimate banker, but maybe it wasn't, who knows? So what I'm trying to, you know, maybe it's just some guy trying to sell me something, you know, insurance, whatever. Uh, but the point is, this, this happens already, you know, we, we have to be on our guard anyway. So, um, I mean, you, you could ask, and anyway, one thing you could do is say, uh, um, so the suppose sounds like a mom, and you could start asking her questions. Hey, do you remember when I, uh, I, 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 I broke my hand? Uh, you remember who, you know, what, what, when was it? Was it in third grade or fourth grade or something? And anyway, start, you know, challenging this thing and, and see, you know, you know uh, so that's that all I can say. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, the, but we have to have that mindset. You yeah. know, it's not that we are in a friendly world yeah. for this in a, in a, anyway. It's true. Um, complex problems need large training sets that are expensive to create. How do we fund the creation of training material to allow research to progress? That's, that's a great, great question, and uh, our um, federal fund, funding agencies have been notoriously uh, absent uh, here. It's much easier to get funding for a very expensive research program with, uh, that tries to get things that cannot happen with a small amount of training data than it is to just get them to pay for creating more training data. That's partly because of how Congress looks at programs. Uh, one thing I, I can say is that we have been spending a lot of uh, effort at Google to generate training data, to create training data that we make freely available, you know, for, for text problems, for image video problems, and we'll continue to do there. And in fact, I, I'm committed to doing more and more of that because I think it's very important for the community. The corporation has to step in and take... Well, take. I mean, look, it would be great if, the, if uh, uh, federal agencies understood the, va the importance of training, but it's kind of... The, uh, there's, Washington has a very short attention span, now more than ever, and, um, and it, just does, it just doesn't... Uh, it's not sexy to create a lot of annotated data. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas it is to create some new, and, and you know, I, I've been to that effort of trying to get funding for that when I was a professor. It's not, it's not fun. Yeah. Uh, uh, which leads me to a, to a related question. What do you think of, of China as a competitor in the AI field, the commitment that they've made as a national um, entity, and, and what is the quality of China, China's AI research at this point? Uh, it's great. I mean, there's fantastic work. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, there's some like any large research enterprise. There can be perverse incentives, right? There's some perverse, some incentives for publication that will sometimes lead to, to strange publish or perish behaviors. But then, come on, you know, it's not as if that doesn't happen yeah. in uh, in uh, uh, tier one in, uh, research universities in the United States. Uh, the I think the quality, the overall quality of the work has been grow, going up very fast. There's amazing stuff going on that I, 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 I think it's very, you know, we have to track. It's great to have the, such a large group of educated people focusing on these problems. I mean, the, you know, everybody worries, oh, you know, because, you know, if we have a disapproval of some countries, uh, organization, political things, that it's bad that they are doing science, but actually I think the, in the long run, in the grand scheme of things, it's a positive sum for the whole world that everybody's doing science and more, more people are doing science. I mean, in fact, you know, if, if we are worried that say the United States and Europe may not be investing as much in science as they should, it's a good thing that others are stepping up. And uh, because in the end, the, the solution to the big social, pro the big problems, for instance, of climate change or of health is going to require a lot of advance in all areas of science and technology. And I honestly don't care where that solution comes from. And having so many millions of, of young people excited about science and technology is a great boon for the world. So what is your perspective on the responsibility of companies like Google and Amazon to work on what Nick Bostrom refers to as the control problem, as opposed to leaving that work to groups like OpenAI, of which Google is not a sponsor? And I guess- I don't know quite The control what... problem, as, as I understand it, is I assume a self-aware system that somehow escapes control. 
So it's, it's making an assertion about the rate of progress and where the technology will go to. <laughs> oh, gosh, I, I, I don't know where to start there. I mean, look, let me give my interpretation for that one that actually is something I care about a lot. About a lot. Uh, it's, it's very important. Forget about self-awareness. I think it's certainly, I mean, I could be very wrong, but I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, or in maybe even in anybody's lifetime in this room. Uh, but uh, the main, th the thing about being able to control complex digital systems is a real issue, right? Uh, so being able to say, don't do that, is a real issue. Large machine learning um, model, machine learning models are not very easy to instruct. You can only give them what training examples, but sometimes what you don't, you don't have enough training examples. You say, don't be bad. You know, how do you do that? So one of the, the things that I, I, a lot of uh, arguments around machine learning uh, these days and AI are about, oh, these are these opaque black box systems. We don't understand them. We need them to be explainable. And I say, no, you don't care about explainability. What you care about is controllability. You want to have a, an emergency break on this thing, right? And, and that, that, I think, is a very important uh, consideration in when you're building any closed-loop systems interact with the world, is how can we, when you identify a, ba a behavior that is detrimental, how do we stop it quickly? Uh, can we have monitoring systems that, and in fact, all the systems we build have you know, emergency breaks in them of various kinds. But of course, like any emergency breaks, like your immune system, they can be defeated by adversaries. So we have to be always vigilant, always working to find you know, more, control, more control loops to control. Because the, the, this is, I think, something that's missed often in discussions of AI. Even in the systems of today, they, when they are working in closed loop with the world, the a society, whether it is a search system that, that recognizes that some people are searching more for some things than others and, and look at certain results more than others, or uh, you know, a, your uh, social network feed that is ranked independent of how, how you, what you read and what your friends read and so on, those systems are closed loop with the, with the society. And therefore, there's a very complex feedback, nonlinear feedback going on. And learning how to control those systems and to, uh, you know, and to be able to prevent them from doing things that are uh, against your, your values and your policies is very important. And uh, it's getting more important as adversaries get craftier. Which leads us to this next question. Uh, he, he says, or she, I like your comment about accelerating chatbot learning by reading, but um, isn't, quote, fake news writing, which is incorrectly predigested, a huge problem? How do you keep training pure? And if you can answer that, can you please fix the real world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so look, I, I, the, I, I, my, my reaction to the, I mean, look, this is a very good point, but uh, honestly, uh, misinformation has been in existence since writing, in fact, probably hearsay, misinformation by voice was uh, been around for a few hundred thousand years probably. Uh, it's just the thing which I think is different is uh, the reach of misinformation. It's not that, mis you, know, you know, fake news has been around forever, right? It's just that now fake news can f travel fast to many destinations. Now, what's interesting question there is, is it the content that we are worried about? Because lies and, and uh, dissembling have been around forever. Is, is rather that the way that it networks itself and that it is propagated by uh, people that are susceptible to it is something that is a new thing. And I think that figuring out that put some uh, friction in those exchanges, in, especially in social networks, is something that could make a big difference. You know, lies will be always around. It's a question is how far do they go and how many people do they mislead? And, and that's where I think there can be an intervention based on the sort of the network structure of the propagation of particular items, which can be, may be very different between items that are trustworthy and items that are not. Okay. 
let's make this the final question. Um, do you have any thoughts on how NLP will affect human use of language as speech interfaces become more ubiquitous in the same way that people have adapted both behaviorally and neurologically to using keyboards and haptic technologies? How is this going to change? Yeah, so, so uh, one thing you know is everybody just knows about keyword Ds. Right, you you know when you type to Google, you you just say the keywords. You don't put any function words, right? You don't say, you know, uh, uh, how when the who won the the 2017 Physics Nobel Prize. You say 2017 Physics Nobel, and that's it. Why do you do that? Because you adapted. You say uh, this thing doesn't care about those function words anyway, right? You learn from that. Uh, now the interesting thing is that when people use speech, even though they know they are talking to the same machine, sort of. The fact of the matter is that they still put the function words because it's very hard to speak in that robotic way. It's much harder to speak than to write because, of course, typing is not that natural where speaking is very natural. Uh, so it's still early days to know how people will adapt to speaking with machines. It's a, it's a very interesting question. I don't know of any concrete data. What we do know is the sort of the, the thing that queries, spoken queries, are much longer than uh, like, written queries, yeah. and they have much more grammatical structure. Can you exploit that? Is that useful to you? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's quite helpful because uh, you could not, you know, if you try to diagram a, a, a written query, you know, it, it's just the word salad, right? But, you've, but you can diagram a spoken query often enough to help you decide, oh, this person is looking for a, a date rather than for a place, say, uh, and then do it very reliably by using fairly s uh, simple machine learned grammatical models. Uh, so there's a big difference there. Will it evolve? I know, I'm sure it will. I, I don't know where it will go. Okay. Well, somehow I found it tremendously reassuring that you find this all still very challenging. So <laughs> please join me in thanking Fernando for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.